I'm going to continue and, and finalize a series I've been on for, uh, really, this is our sixth session in this series, but it's been several months uh, with other guest speakers, Pastor John David, of course, in the pulpit at least once in their communion service and some other special services, I believe, that the Lydiards were with us. And so, but for six, six sessions, I've been talking about this. Of course, I want to say right up front, Next week, we've got Cheryl Allen here. How many have heard Cheryl Allen? Come on, just a few. Listen, you need to come. Love Cheryl Allen. She is a single woman leading a prosperous, successful ministry in California. She is leading the uh, Pasadena House of Prayer, and they are, they are rocking it out there. Uh, she does so many other things, and she has more and more engagements every year, and we just... Hope and pray we can get her, and Morgan Mitchell gets her at the House of Prayer on Saturday, and then we welcome her on Sunday mornings, both services. But she always has a fresh word, as only a woman can bring it. And so we're excited to have her in the pulpit. So come on out to Cheryl Allen, bring somebody with you. Uh, the week after that, Pastor John David's going to be in the pulpit. I'll be here for all these because I love it. I love sitting there and listening to refreshing words that other people in this pulpit brings. But he'll be here, and then the week after, we'll have another communion celebration. And then the week after that, moving into, gosh, it's going to be June, right? Am I right? Yeah. Moving to June, I've got a series I want to start. I'm just putting a little advertisement here. I titled it, I Am Jacob. And we're going to look at the life of Jacob and, I'm sure, reflect on some other things, even stories in my life. And I really believe... That if God is going to use anyone beyond their ability, there's a place of breaking in our lives. You say, well, does God bring that? I believe God allows it. And that might be a hard pill for people to swallow. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So th there's a success story on the other side of it. But life is challenging. Life can kick you in the teeth sometimes. But if we will, like Jacob... Facing our greatest fear, and I just can't wait to get into this message. Allow God in that breaking to give us a name that only he can give us. Then we're going to minister in a way that only we can minister. And that's what God wants. Not an echo, but a voice in the time we live in. Amen? And so you'll want to come for that series. It's going to be exciting moving in to summer. So many great things coming this summer. We'll tell you more about our youth conference. We've already mentioned that coming up in July, and we'll have other weeks to talk about it. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to turn, as we have been in this series, 2 Timothy chapter 3. I want to read a portion of verse 16. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, say profitable, profitable. for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Let's pray. Father, I pray this morning that you would help us see the word of God for what it is, that it's something that can bring correction, it's something that can... Be profitable, give us good doctrine, reproof, helping us to live the righteous life that you've given us through Christ Jesus. In his name we pray, and everybody said, amen. amen. And so we've been on this series, like I say, a number of, of months. Uh, in the NIV, it says God breathed, and, and so we, we understand that all of Scripture, somebody say all. all, not just the New Testament, not just the Old Testament, but all, somebody say all. Is God breathed, so you could say it's co-authorship, written by many, many people on different continents, different countries, different ages, different millennia, but all with a similar message. And sometimes people say, well, I, I like the God of the New Testament, the Testament better than the God of the Old Testament. It's the same God. And even though I understand the Old Testament talks a lot about judgment because it was necessary, and the New Testament shows us the grace that Jesus brought us, but God has always extended grace, even in the garden. I mean, it starts in the beginning, right? Adam and Eve sin. God says, Adam, where are you? It's grace. So in the Old Testament, we do see a measure of judgment, but hey, there's judgment in the New Testament too. I mean, there's one time when somebody didn't bring their tithes in Acts chapter 5, and God struck them both dead for lions. Sorry, I hate to, hate to bring bad news on the congregation on Sunday. <laughs> But that's another message for a building campaign or something. I'm just, I'm just, just teasing. You. <laughs> so there's judgment. 
But see, you can't have grace without judgment. And God is a just judge. But all through the Old Testament, you see prophecies. I believe that even in the creation of man, God makes us in his image. It's almost like he creates man in his image, and I think kind of winks and says, oh, by the way, I'm going to become one of you someday. Because he prophesies that the seed of the woman will come, and even though the serpent will wound his heel, that he will crush his skull. And so God is already looking ahead because he already knew, even before the fall, that they would. But he already had it planned. The Bible says, chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. And so we see throughout the writings of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, we see the ambassador or the messenger of Yahweh showing up, walking among his people for just glimpses and times we've looked at so many of these. He appears to Abraham, he appears to Jacob, which we'll talk about in a bit. Joshua, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. But I believe in each of those apparitions, if you will, it reveals just a, another side or another facet of his personality. Putting a picture together till finally Jesus came and said, Philip and the others, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. A picture of the Father in human form. So all through the Old Testament, what we see, and we'll see again today in the stuff that we'll share, is that it always looks back, but it also points forward. So prophecy does that. And we've read all this. Please get online. God showed us some awesome things. We see all through scriptures that there's a whole string of women that are barren, and God blesses them with a child. Again, speaking or prophesying of the virgin birth. We see God favoring the younger son over the older son which was not the tradition, but God did it time and again. Again, reflecting on what Jesus would do to bring the light to the Gentiles, but then maybe you're fasting and praying with us at the close of service, we're going to pray for Israel. We're in a 21-day prayer strike, praying for the globe to be reached with the glory and the gospel of Jesus Christ, but praying specifically for the Jewish people in Jerusalem. But that's all part of God's plan, is that he would redeem all of mankind through Jesus, the Messiah. We see God showing up on mountains. Again, we've looked at so much of this. I think it's, it's just interesting to point it out. We talked about how the Garden of Eden was lush, but there was a mountain there, the mountain of God. And so we see that God suffered on a mountain called Calvary for you and I. And he'll return, and the Bible says when he returns... He's bringing his city with him, y'all. Huh. And boom, he's going to land on, you guessed it, a mountain. And he'll dwell with his people forever from Jerusalem. We'll talk a little more about that this morning. And of course, over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about old creation, new creation, the Messiah, and how I believe that God is not only a creator, but also a redeemer. And some people think it's different hats, but no, I think it's one and the same. I say this, God is a re-creator. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that when we come to him, when, when we make Jesus Christ our Lord, that we are a new creation. What does that mean? Something like never existed. Some of you are saying, boy, I know somebody I know has got to get changed because I want to see a move of God. And this is how it happens. We become not just new, but like something that never happened before. It's a recreation, if you will. And so God does this all through pointing to it in the Old Testament, looking back to garden where it all started. Remember, when God created, he said it's good. It was good until the fall. And all through the Old Testament, you'll see pictures of God's homes. And all of those homes, again, they, they look backward as well as forward. And if you were to read the Bible, I believe, with chapters referencing that fact, God's Old Testament homes. It might read like this, chapter 1, Genesis and the creation account. Chapter 2 might be the tabernacles as the new Eden. We'll talk a little bit about this this morning. Chapter 3 might be the temple as the tabernacle or Eden expanded. Again, I'll give you some thoughts on this this morning. Chapter 4 would be the work of the Messiah and his church. We're in that church age. Right now he's building his church. And then chapter 5, the completion, the new heavens, the new earth. 
And I think God doesn't want us to just read one or the other, but to flip back and forth. I think that's the great thing about the Bible, is we can go back and forth. And when we start to understand that it's God's master plan for redeeming mankind, we take it a little different when we read it. We start to see all these glimpses in the Old Testament, looking back, referencing the garden, but looking forward. I like to think of it this way. I think God is taking us back to Eden. I could have named this Back to Eden. Some of you may not know this. Some of you do. Trish and I live on Eden Street. I was, Paul, you're at this service. I mean, you and I have talked about that, haven't we? I, I, when I did this service, I, or this uh, series, as I was thinking, I didn't create or put this thing together thinking that, but we live on Eden Street. And I do believe that God is in the recreation business, recreation with me, recreation with you, raising up this church from a multitude of things that could have destroyed it years ago. And now people that love one another are reaching out to the lost in Traverse City. But we're just getting started, y'all. God's doing some great things. And so he's getting us back to Eden. Let's start from the beginning. Best place to do it. Look at this. Again, chapter 1 of Genesis. I'm going to read a number of verses. So uh, kind of follow with me. Verse 4, verses 6 and 7, 14 and 18. And God saw that saw the light that it was good, and God divided or separated the light from the darkness. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide or separate, some translations say, the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which are under the firmament from the waters which are above the firmament. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide or separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, it's an important word, and for, God, and for days and years, and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide or separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So this word divide or separate is a Hebrew verb. It's not only used here, but throughout the Old Testament in particular. All right? And we're not going to do a line upon line here, but... Study it out. Get some helps. Get some Bible programs. Check it out. There's people smarter than you and I that can help us study the Bible, and I need their help. But the thing is, you see throughout, not only in creation, this type of language, but you see it when God gives instructions for building the tabernacle, when God gives instructions for building the temple, when God gives instructions on the Aaronic priesthood and the way things had to be done. He said, well, do the, on the first day, do this. On the seventh day, on this day, but then separate this. And the, you, all this, these kind of, what you see is you see these words that are used, not only divide or separate, but the other one, we read it, signs and seasons, that word is, would be, could be translated tabernacle. Now, in the English, we don't see the connection, but the truth is, I believe that when God creating he was building himself a sanctuary. Of course, sin entered, ruined it, but God's got other plans. Come on, somebody. And so he continued to show his people, look, I've got this plan from the beginning. Reflecting. Don't forget. Don't forget. What I started, I will complete it. It's going to take a 6,000-year plan, roughly. But we see patterns of seven. Again, the tabernacle, the temple, the priesthood. And so I think God is really saying you cannot understand creation without looking at the tabernacle, the temple, the priesthood, and vice versa. Looking at them in tandem, if you will. And even though Eden and its garden were unique to creation, the entirety of creation, I believe, was originally fashioned to be the vast temple of God. Look at this, some scriptures we've read before, but now you see it in light of what we're looking at. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. Psalm 98, let the rivers clap their hands, let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. Remember when Jesus was here, his followers were praising him, and some criticized and told him to be quiet. Jesus said, if they didn't praise me, the rocks would cry out. Whew. I think there's a sound of praise and worship. I just believe this. Not only in the stars, but even here on earth, 
that we don't hear anymore because of our fallen nature. Amen. I mean, we get a glimpse, and you sit out back, nice and quiet, listen to the... I love spring and summer, man. I, get, I like to listen to the birds. We got a, got a few birdhouses, got one. They build a nest every, every year right off our deck, and I sit here, and, it just, and they check me out, and they, they whistle at me. I'm like, it's okay. They don't believe me, <laughs> but they build it anyway. And so I think if we can see in part if we enjoy the creation... It is declaring the praises of God, but it's a fallen world since sin entered. But that's, God didn't create it that way in the beginning. It reverberates with worship as within the walls. This morning we're singing those songs, and I think all of creation is so much more glorious in worship than even our songs. Even when we sing it, somebody said, well, why do you worship almost an hour? Because he's worthy. Amen. He's worthy. Sometimes we got to sit down. I get it. When I'm in a long worship service and I'm not, I'm already sitting down when I play drums. <laughs> but that's all right. Yep. We're enjoying his presence. It's just giving us a glimpse of what it looked like. Hello, somebody. And what it's going to be like in the future. Yeah. God shows up. And the truth is that in creating the tabernacle, the temple, it's like a microcosm of the world and the universe, I believe, and then giving specific instructions to the priesthood and how they should carry their duties. Well, we're going to talk a little more about that in some more detail in a second. But I think it's the only place after the fall when you see the tabernacle and temple where the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve could come that God could dwell. And so things had to be done specifically Again, reflecting back to what he had done in the, in the beginning and then certainly forward prophecy after prophecy to what would come again to this world. I, we, in this series, and you'll see when I close it today, I've already said this for a few weeks, some Christians, don't, they think we're going to float around on clouds and play harps. That, that is so far from the truth. God comes back here, makes a new heaven and a new earth, and we live with him forever back to Eden, if you will his people, his family. It's always been God's plan. But in the time of the tabernacle and the temple, it was the only place that people could come for forgiveness, could come for cleansing. Yet again, those are only images. God had other plans. Let's talk about Adam and Eve themselves. I believe that they were the first, if you will, priestly couple in the garden says in Genesis again, 2.15, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep. That word tend means to work. Many of us may know that. It means to work. But they were to work the garden and to keep it. That's part of it. But I think it was more than really planting tomatoes and picking cherries, if you will. That's only part of it. But they were to work it, and they were also to guard it. In fact, this could be translated, and originally it, it, it was, to serve and to guard, all right? In the original texts elsewhere, in the Old Testament, we see God using similar languages, I said up front, telling not only Adam and Eve to work and to guard what they were responsible for, but again, in the tabernacle and the temple with preparation and how the priests were to do things, he said, this is the work, this is what you'll guard. You say the same kind of language. In fact, look at this, Deuteronomy 11. And you shall be careful, see that kind of language, to be careful, to, to, to guard, to observe all the statutes and judgments, which I set before you today. These are the statutes and judgments which you should be careful to observe in the land which the Lord of your fathers has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. Again, other texts use similar language describing the duties of the priests. Look at this. Numbers 3. And they, and they shall attend, attend, the same word, to his needs and the needs of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of meeting. So attend, again, remember, to work and to guard. To do the work of the tabernacle, also they shall attend, work and guard, 
to all the furnishings of the tabernacle of meeting and to the needs of the children of Israel to do the work of the tabernacle. See, I think Adam's duties were like that of the priests to come and kind of vice versa. They were just following the same instructions that God had given Adam and Eve. Of course, they failed, but God had other plans. Come on, somebody. God had other plans. So they were to guard. They were to work it. So I think Adam and Eve were the first priests. And look what else God tells them to do in Genesis 2, 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Many of us know this passage. So God gave Adam, the first priest, something to not only tend, but something to guard. Something to guard. A divine word revolving around what and what not to eat. But I think it was much more than that. So there's many ways that Adam and Eve served God, but he said you're supposed to guard this one thing. If you eat of that tree, you will die. There's a similar warning given to ministers in the tabernacle, not only once, but multiple times. We're only going to read one passage because, boy, just check it out yourself. Get through the Old Testament. Take a look at the tabernacle building, the temple instructions. All, it's, it's amazing. You'll see this reflected. Exodus 30, look at this. And when they go into the tabernacle of meeting and when they come near the altar to minister to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water lest they die. Come on. <laughs> so they shall wash their hands and their feet lest they die. Again, you see it elsewhere. This is just one scripture that I'm referencing. In fact, if you really study out, one of the things they did is the, the priest who would minister in the Holy of Holies. We'll talk about that a little bit at the end of our message today. But the priest, when he would go in there, God gave Moses instructions. He said, put at the bottom of his robe, a pomegranate, a bell, a pomegranate, a bell. Alternating all around. His, the, so when he was in there working, you could hear him. Jing, 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 doing the work, tending, and guarding the place where God would dwell in that period of time. And then they would tie a rope to his ankle, they say, because if he stopped ringing, he was dead. And they were going to pull him out because nobody's going in there. <laughs> Eat of the tree and you'll die. Don't wash properly, tend properly, and guard my instructions or you'll die. It's pretty severe, but it's true. Of course, God had other plans. <laughs> but not only were they to tend, but to guard Eden from anything that might endanger it. And you may say, well, what could endanger it? The serpent. <laughs> the snake. So not only did they not guard the word of the Lord to not eat of that tree, they also allowed the snake to deceive them. So they blew it on both counts. All right? And many of us know the story. We've reflected on it quite a bit, even in this series. But So there they are. They've eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God shows up. Looking for Adam, he doesn't answer. When God finally sees them, they're covering themselves up. At that point, God starts to pronounce judgment on the man, the woman, the curse that will follow because of that in the earth. He curses the devil. I already talked a little bit about that, but then prophesies how the seed of the woman will bruise, or you will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, but he'll crush your head. Prophesying of the Messiah that would come that would start the completed work. Again, Jesus legally defeated the devil, but there's coming a time when he will defeat him literally. And that's coming in the future. And so they blew it. They fall. Immediately God says, you're banished from Eden. You can't stay here anymore. Why? It was a perfect place. 
And because of sin, God wasn't even going to be able to stay there any longer. Oh, he could visit, and we see that through the Old Testament. Heaven is his throne right now, but he's coming back. Come on. And so he gives us ways to be able to minister to him and to feel his presence ultimately through Jesus. We'll look at that as we close too. But then the Lord places an angel to what? To guard the tree of life. So we see another guard. And so all through the description of the priesthood, they're to guard things. Similar language. Instructing the tabernacle, instructing the temple. Developing the priesthood. So God guards it. Says you're going to have to go. And I said before, I really believe that when God put that guard and exiled them from Eden, it was not only judgment, it was also grace and mercy. Because God said, guard the tree lest they eat of it and remain in this state forever. Their fallen state. There wouldn't, wouldn't be redemption. That's what I believe. So Adam and Eve were not only to guard the garden sanctuary, but they were also to expand it until the whole earth there's something special about Eden, something special about creation in general, but something they were supposed to do with this special dwelling place. And God said this to them, Genesis 1. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I believe Adam and Eve and their descendants were supposed to Edenize the earth. Take that glorious sanctuary and just expand what the heavens were declaring, what the fields were clapping. And throughout the Old Testament, God expands his kingdom through covenantal blessings with Noah, with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, with Moses, and David. Many prophesying of the Messiah that would come. And their descendants were to subdue the enemies of God and build a place for his sanctuary and then take him with them in the tabernacle case, in the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, if you look at the design of the tabernacle and then later in the temple, as well as the furnishings, it resembles a great sanctuary that is called Eden. I want to read a few things. If you, if you look at the design, you'll, you'll see some of these. You can look it out... Check it out on your own. The menorah, which was one of the pieces of instruments, furniture, that, furniture there, the menorah was designed to look like a flowering tree. There were 10 of those in the temple. It was almost like it was an iconic tree of life, if you will. It was shining in this place. It brought light and life. The curtains of the tabernacle had woven images of cherubim. The cedar of the temple had those same images with palm trees and open flowers. You get this garden type of feel in the tabernacle, and again, reproduced in the temple. There's an immense bronze sea that, of course, was used to labor for, for washing for some of the functions that the priesthood were, were to do. There were 10 smaller bases that had basins, rather, that had the likeness of lions, oxen, cherubim. So you see, it's almost like a picture of Eden with God's creation just remembering how it was so that the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve could come into that place that was designed for God and it was like he was saying, hey, you're back in Eden. This is a picture of what I once created but where we're going in the future. You say, well, pastor, what does this all mean? I'm glad you asked. This is where I believe it ends and there's so many details that in this study, we've kind of left out because dig on your own. You'll find some things out. You'll find out more than I've even exposed, but this will help. The recreated final sanctuary, Revelation chapter 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold the tabernacle, do you see that? 
of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He's finally with, it's like, here we go. The end of the story. Finally, I'm with my people. Back to Eden, if you will. It's interesting to me that this city is described in Revelation, and it says it's a cube that is overlaid or covered in gold. I believe it is a, it is the existence of what the Holy of Holies was pointing to. The Holy of Holies, much smaller in size, but it was also a cube that was inlaid or covered, if you will, with gold, like the temple. One other thing about the priests in the Old Testament, when the high priest was to enter the holiest of holies, one of the things they would have to wear would be a headband that had God's name on it. <laughs> That's one of the things they had to do. And I'm going to show you what I believe that was reflective of. Revelation 22. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face and his what? His name shall be on their foreheads. So again, just these little details of the priest. It was pointing back to a time when Eden and God's creation was perfect, but to the time that was to come, all through this 6,000-year process, we may question, well, why 6,000 years? There's a lot I don't know. Why those birds don't trust me? I mean, I look just like God, don't I? You know? No, they know I'm not. So what's our commission? Some of us know. See, Jesus compared his body to a new temple which would be torn down, but in three days it would be built back up. He was reflecting on his death, burial, and resurrection. All right? That's John 2, verses 19 and 22. You and I in Christ, Romans chapter 6 and other places, say that we're baptized into his death, but raised to life through that same act of baptism. And you and I co-die, but we're co-raised with him. 1 Peter 2, 5, it says that we're living stones. <clears throat> Excuse me, in this temple of the Lord. Ephesians 2, verses 20 and 21 Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a what? Dwelling place of God in the spirit. So we're his temple now. If we're born again, God is in us. Think about that. Whoo. But now we're commissioned to go and to subdue the earth. Every place that we go, <clears throat> every piece of ground that our feet walk on is holy. Remember, remember when, when God appeared to Moses, he said, take off your sandals. He said the same thing to Joshua. In the tabernacle and the temple, there were certain things the priests had to do because the presence of God is there. But he now lives on the inside of us. It's an amazing thing. So every place we go, we're taking Jesus. If we have a revelation of that, we'll live differently. Now, none of us are ever going to be perfect, so I'm not talking about do this and don't do that. Do this and don't do that certainly are important. But knowing him and the work that he's done in us and where he wants to take us all should put a hunger in our hearts to tell everybody the good news. But so many Christians are like, most Christians don't even know what they say they believe. Well, I think, you know, if you make Jesus your Savior, you, you, maybe if you're a good person, you'll, you'll get to heaven. Oh, wait, wait a minute. You, you're, you're not really preaching the truth. We'll get to live forever. Forever. In fact, if we don't receive Jesus, the tree of life, <coughs> excuse me, We'll continue to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and we'll die. That's the ultimate place people go without Jesus is death. 
natural and then spiritual. And you see it reflected in our society everywhere. Here's what I believe, and you check it out and see if you don't agree with me. Eating of the trial, blah, 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 blah. eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you read Romans chapter one, it's a description of it. When we do that, apart from the truth, Jesus said, "I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life." So whether we agree, it doesn't. Well, that's not fair. It doesn't matter if it's fair. It's it's the only way. <laughs> we want fair. Well, nothing, it's not fair. Sorry. <laughs> but when we eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, rather than the tree of life for salvation, what we do is we, Romans chapter 1, we create God in our image. And we have a world gone crazy that says, well, I don't think a God who loves would do that. You don't know what you're talking about. We are fallen people in a fallen world, but that wasn't the way he made it, and he has the solution. This is more than hoping that you come back as a grasshopper. This is more than hoping that you'll get to heaven. Now, we said in this series, there is a place, heaven. The Bible says that spiritually we are with the Lord. If we die before the rapture, the return, salvation of, of the Jewish people, and then what we just read, God comes back. There's a holding place, but we are changed along with those who have gone and we get resurrected bodies and we live with God forever right here, right here. A new heaven and a new earth, people say, does that mean a new heaven and a new earth or the same heaven and earth only new? Yes. <laughs> people, well, I don't know, Pastor, uh, you know, I, if you don't, I, look, maybe he creates it all new because it says that, but you know, by kicking the devil out and locking the key, or throwing away the key that they lock him up with, just the removal of sin and the devil, I believe that, that right there is a step of new. So, and I'm not, I'm not saying that I understand all that, but it's going to be new. And then we live with him forever. So here's our commission. Matthew 28, go therefore and make disciples or subdue all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. 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 He is with us in spirit to the end of the age, but at the end of this age, we head into the millennium, and God is with us again in his dwelling place. So now, you and I, as we preach the gospel everywhere we go, as we gather and we worship, as baptisms are given, all these things that Jesus says to do, we're living stones, and the dwelling place of God expands and expands and expands and expands until he's like, we're done. I'm coming after my bride. Israel will be saved, and I will be with my people forever. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would help us to understand just more about your plan and that we would, oh, it takes a lifetime to understand this, but we want to. Eye has not seen nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him, but by his spirit, he reveals them. We believe that to be true. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you want to know Jesus, I'm not talking about a bunch of rules. I'm not talking about coming to this church. But if you want to know him and his redemptive power, come down for prayer when we dismiss. One of our prayer team people will tell you how you can do that. Make him Lord of your life, and we want you to be able to do that. But as I mentioned, I wanted to, I wanted to end today. Some of you already are aware of this, but we're in a 21-day prayer strike with millions of people around the globe our local house of prayer, there's some information out on the, in the foyer for a 10-day portion of that where there's going to be worship every night for those 10 days at the house of prayer. Katie and Ryan are probably on every night in that 10 days, but anyway, praying for you guys. You better show up on Sunday. That's all I got to say. Okay. <laughs> Both of them went, okay. But you know what is good? God, God will renew your strength and others as well, but so we're praying and fasting. Some of you know how to fast. Others may not. We have helps on our website. Go to the front page. It will also tell you Isaiah 52. There's all kinds of helps there. 
download the prayer manual is one thing that, that uh, Kansas City House of Prayer puts there. It's a good tool. There's other good things. But that's one that we're following, and I would encourage you to. So today I want to pray around Genesis 17. It says this about Israel, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Father, we thank you that you are faithful to keep your covenant, your promises, not only to Israel, but every one of us. And so we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the soon return of Jesus triumphantly and gather together with the saints and reunited with all of Israel so that they will be saved. Father, we just pray that Christians, that you would soften our hearts towards Israel, that you would soften the hearts of even those in the administration of our government towards Israel, that we would support her, not only prayerfully, but we just pray through government and We've been the friend of Israel for so long. I pray we continue to be. But beyond that, we pray for their salvation. Use us, Lord, to help in part to provoke them to jealousy because that's part of your plan. So we pray for Israel that they will be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.